Tonight, Mr. Jeremy Jones joins us. Jones joins us. <laughs> Say that fast 25 times. Anyway, uh, Jeremy is an architect and a painter. So we have uh, dual guns aimed at us tonight. And it ought to be fascinating as we talk to Jeremy about the two careers simultaneous and uh, how one affects the other and a little bit about uh, Jeremy's career. He uh, was the winner of one of 12 Arizona Architect Medals in 2008 as the Director of Design at DWL Architects and Planners Incorporated and serves as Vice Chairman of the Scottsdale Development Review Board. He was one of the primary architects of the Mesa Arts Center, and he designed the Appaloosa Library in Scottsdale and West Branch Library scheduled to be built in Glendale. A very busy architect. Other kudos, President of Arizona Watercolor Association, member of Contemporary Watercolorists of Arizona, President of Central Arizona Chapter AIA, 1998. He had his Bachelor of Architecture from University of Washington and he was born in Spokane at Fort George Wright on October 14th, 1944. I'm sure that date just rings bells in everybody's brains. Many forms of art have been important to Jeremy since he was very young and he drew constantly during school, regardless of what the rest of the class happened to be doing at the time. Sounds like a number of us here as well. Accumulated 85 sketchbooks. That's a lot of drawing, Jeremy. Other projects include glass tile murals, furniture design, stained glass, cast glass window design for churches, and other artwork for buildings. And more recent work includes abstract painting and watercolor and water-based oil paints, which he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, tonight and even brought a sample along. So without my blathering on anymore, Jeremy, will you take over and talk to these people? This initial picture is a good example of what kind of turns me on, and that is I was sitting um, I had an apartment in Spokane, Washington. I'd just gotten a job there. The family hadn't moved yet. I was still looking for a house. And I was just sitting there reading about the brain and how the brain works and how these little messages start out and they just spread out through the brain and contact all different parts and it forms an image and how it works. And I looked outside and it was raining. And the raindrops hit this little puddle and all those little concentric circles went out. And I just started doodling around and ended up with this, and it's now in a permanent collection in Washington, D.C. But it just shows, you know, came out of nothing. And I think that's the way it is for artists a lot of times. You start out with something and do something else altogether. So we'll have some more examples of that. So initially I just drew. I just drew all the time. And... Uh, took different directions like earlier I would do a drawing like the one on the left of the Rocky Mountains you know you, where you get 20 minutes while everybody else has a snowball fight and uh, sketch what I could with the idea that I'd finish it later uh, the difference this time was I got up turned around and there were 20 people standing there watching me and I'd never noticed that they existed at all I think artists go into their own little world now. I know at least one here does so, and the picture to the right then is much later, it's uh, an orchard in Washington State, Central Washington, that might not seem to be interesting at first, but there's something about the little drifts of snow and the leaves from the, the previous fall and the fruit still on the vine, and then just in the break in the orchard there's like a whole other world out there, and I was trying to say more and get more of a psychological reaction. Um, a lot of my work looks like an architect did it. The uh, church on the upper right in Arlington, Virginia is pretty accurate. It's pretty much the way the building was. I didn't move too many things around. Uh, left all the detail off the tombstones because that would have been distracting. 
and just the idea of looking through the ages to see these old buildings, you know, pretty simple, straightforward kind of thing. The picture on the left was when I really started playing with perspective to see what I could do to make things feel a lot better or different and make them feel like um, you were right in the space. So if you were to look at the upper part of the sketch, you realize you're looking up. If you look at the bottom, you realize you're looking straight forward. And in actuality, you couldn't see that much in one view. So I've actually rotated your vision as I went up the sketch. And this came back maybe 10 years later as an idea. So I moved to Arizona uh, about the time that the uh, Boeing did not get the supersonic transport. And they laid off 60,000 people. And we thought, things are probably better in Arizona than they are in Seattle. So I started working for Michael and Kemper Goodwin, and we got a job to do a clinic. And uh, this is probably a good time to tell you that my father was a weatherman. <laughs> so the idea of doing a green building and designing with the environment and designing with the weather in mind and so forth, was it was just an obvious thing to do for me. So this particular building uh, was unusual in that it had to be rentable and profitable. And one way to do that is to put the biggest floors on the bottom and get smaller as you went up. So it started out as a step building. And then somewhere along the line, it occurred to me that if I put all the corridors outside, we wouldn't have to air condition those. So eventually we ended up with this sloped face, two big floors on the bottom. The bottom floor was a half a story down. Uh, the next floor was half a story up. So they could be reached by ramps. So well over two-thirds of all the people who ever come to this building just walk up a ramp, don't use that elevator in the middle. And the east and west ends were solid, so the low angle sun couldn't get in. And then we had a completely different kind of facade on the south with self-shading. So this was the first building that I ever did that won an award where I was in charge of the design by myself. And it was Okay, so this is the uh, Appaloosa Library. It would have been my maybe 12th library. And uh, I got it partly because my final argument to the interview group was, you have to pick me because I'm married to the story lady. <laughs> so my wife uh, was a children's librarian. Um, what we wanted to achieve here was to feel permanent and yet lightweight have a lot of light and let a lot of things happen. So this would be one of my early design sketches to show the client how things would look. Now we were also developing computer models. We were designing this on a computer um, three-dimensionally, but a lot of clients vastly prefer these hand-done illustrations. So just to orient you a little bit, the main shiny panel there was um, a metal panel with uh, quartz floating in a clear solution. And if you look straight at the panel, especially up close, you can see the silver of the panel. But the quartz reflects green light from a slight angle. And then if you go to a more extreme angle, it looks purple. So as you rotate around this building or approach it, it changes color and kind of shimmers. And uh, we wanted this building to somewhat be a mirage. So for example, the high roof floats three feet above all the support panels. And especially at night, the roof is floating all by itself. The one three-colored wall there right in the middle is thick concrete. So it looks permanent. Everything else seems to float. Your earliest recollection to exposure to art. Uh, the first time I got in trouble doing art was uh, I had some new crayons and I did a mural on the living room wall. A mural? And yeah, well, you know, by the time you do a dog and your two of your brothers and a sister and the house and, and the parents. And the you're car, walking around the wall. Yeah, and I got in so much trouble over that that I ran away from home. I was four. I ran away from home and I went by a garage and the guy had opened all his cans of paint to see, you know, it's right after the Depression, and, you know, World War II and all that, to see what colors he had. And then he got a phone call and in those days phones were connected to a wire inside the house. So he had to go I inside. Remember. Do you? Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so he left and I came in and there were all these brushes and all this paint, a big white wall in his garage. So I did another mural. So that's how I got started pretty much.
You know? My dad says since he came by looking for me later, the guy was still laughing, so he had the right attitude. <laughs> what point did you decide that you wanted to do, get into architecture? Um, I was actually in aeronautical and astronautical engineering um, because I liked building airplane models, putting rocket engines on them, flying them. Um, and I liked all the science that was related to that. But I really didn't like the math once I got into it. And I kept looking at all the other guys that were majoring in this stuff, and I thought, I don't really fit here. <laughs> and one day I was home from college and driving around with my dad, the weatherman, <clears throat> and we went by a brand new building. And uh, it was raining. And he looked at that building and he said, I can't believe they left that out in the rain. And I thought, Gee, I could do a better building than that. I've never done one before, so I changed majors. Do you agree that form must follow function in architecture? And if so, does the practice of painting provide a kind of relief for what must be a narrower approach to creating architectural form? Well, most of my buildings have been public buildings. So you're working with tax money, politicians, um, and people who do government jobs, the, the kind of jobs that people don't appreciate. You know, there's a lot of people who work for the government who just do really good, important work like weathermen. But uh, <laughs> uh, don't get me started on weathermen. But uh, the buildings had to do whatever they were intended to do. And if you're going to do that, you might as well do it really well. I think my only deviation from form following function was that it ought to be fun while you're doing it. So actually most of my buildings have been very efficient and especially like the Mesa Art Center, we tried to get way more art center for the money than anybody else was getting. So we had a hundred million dollars to work with. The uh, Florida, a big town Florida had an art center of six hundred million dollars for the same size and ours was built in a third the time at a sixth of the budget and the acoustics are better. Drawing is basic to both disciplines you practice. How important is it for students to master drawing in contemporary times? Well, buildings now start out in the bigger firms. So I think some people still do hand draw buildings, but not many. A, a building starting out now starts out three-dimensionally on a computer. You draw a line from point A to point B, you tell the computer that this is four inches of brick, some waterproofing and airspace, um, insulation, studs, chipboard, and it's 12 feet high. And that kind of wall is drawn like that. And you draw that wherever that wall is going to be, and then you start in the next part. By the time you've finished schematic design, a contractor can do a material takeoff instantly. and just presses a button. Um, but there's delusions in it. For one thing, Everybody's still learning how to do that, so the designs have gotten super simple so that you can do it easier on the computer. If you want to do a wall that goes like that, which is no harder than that when you're hand drawing, uh, it's, it's really very difficult. So the computer is slowing down design in a lot of ways. So we had an incident, we were doing an eight-story uh, dental college in Chicago. And one of the younger architects was working on it, and he had this model going, and he'd rotate it around, and he'd look at this, and he'd look at that, and we'd critique it, and he'd make the changes. And uh, so I was watching him for a while, and I said, I need a view of the entry. That, that entry just isn't good enough, and it won't handle the weather in Chicago, and I really need to study that for a while, and um, I'll get an idea right back to you to work on. But give me a shot, looking at the front entry from 50 feet, a little bit off to the right, five feet above the ground, and by the way, put all the cars back on the ground. He goes, what? And I said, well, some of your cars are floating in the air and some of them are partly <laughs> underground. He goes, what do you mean? And he said, just do it. So he gets the viewpoint and there's cars flying up here and cars down on the ground. And he said, how did you know they weren't on the ground? And I said, I've done a lot of drawing. Try it. <laughs> And then he ran the print for me, and I freehanded out what needed to happen for the entry and gave it back, and he built it on the computer. But a lot of people working on computers have no idea what they're creating right now. Have you ever had an architectural client you just couldn't satisfy? I think 
I waited them out until they knew they were running out of time, or we're going to have to settle on something. Uh, churches are a fun thing to do. I did one Baptist church where we had all these meetings. Everybody came in. All these presentations were made. We did all these studies. You know, showed all the alternatives. The people left, and then the pastor said, "Okay, here's what we're going to do." Like the meetings had never happened, <laughs> and uh, I didn't get along with him real well. But um, I listened very carefully, and then I drew something else. And we presented it when we knew he was going to be on vacation when they built it. So, you know, you can work with stuff like that. What advice would you have for a young would-be architect just starting out in his or her career? Well, when they're starting the career, it may be already too late. Um, I'd like, well, I do talk to them, you know, in their last couple years in school. And I try to get them to take extra psychology courses and learn more about people because most of the students who are good enough to get into the second year of architecture will find a way to design, especially the form follows function logical, careful, methodical uh, designers. The more artistic ones will get more artistic if they're really excited and keep going. But um, the big part of the job is going to be figuring out how to work with people. You know, a good example. You, um, you'd like to get to them sooner than they're when they're in college. Yeah, you get to them in high school or junior high or just the sooner you start studying other people at first in a methodical way, so that you are more observant when you watch people later on. I mean, social skills are one of the most important things in any profession. It's nice to go off in a corner and do our artwork, but. What you can do with your artwork for other people, um, what you'll do with it, is all about working with other people. And I'll give you a good example of how to use a sketchbook to control a meeting. So we had a, on the Mesa Art Center, we had this new superintendent come in who was going to make up six months of time that the contractor had lost. And for a bunch of complicated reasons. So they brought in a tough guy, winning through intimidation kind of guy. It was big in the 50s. And uh, he started out his first meeting that he was there with this tirade, mostly profanity, and there's these nice ladies from the city there, you know, 16 people around a table, and it's like, okay, I think I know where he's coming from. So I got my sketchbook open and started doing his portrait. Mm -hmm. And he kept going, and he went on and on, you know, if you think Jeremy Jones a blankety-blankety-blank, you can reject the concrete that came out of him, you know, and on and on and on. He's trying to go, <laughs> like this, turning red. Closed my sketchbook and I said, well, I'm glad you got that out of your system. Now, here's what we're going to do, like it had never happened. And it worked. He wanted to be intimidated. We weren't intimidated. End of story. But the key was the sketchbook. <laughs>